From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights, with your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers Insiders, Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Rant. We're back. It's been a minute, fellas. All three of us here, Fonseca, Lanny, Politi. Talk some Rutgers football, Rutgers basketball first. How's your how's your summer going? I gotta tell you, I know. So I know, fun's like you've been in Portugal, and I gotta tell you, it took it took every ounce of restraint, every ounce of my being, not to text you when you're sitting there with a sangria in Lisboa, or you know, to, to not to text you and say, "Are you gonna file something on Dylan Harper?" That was just all I was gonna say. Was, my entire my entire text was just gonna be be that, just to see if you would how you would have responded. Half in the bag on on sangria. Well, first of all, I drank a lot of beer. We drink a lot of uh, what they call them finush, which are like finush, the, uh, finush. Yeah, uh, and I drank a lot of finush. Uh, my blood is probably ten percent beer right now, super bog. <laughs> but I did not use my phone when I was out. I kept my phone on airplane mode and would only really? use Wi Fi when I went back to the hotel, so, just so I could not get that unsolicited text from you. But if you <laughs> did send that. When I got back to the hotel at 11 p.m., I would have croaked. I would have had some form of health issue, and I would never come back from Portugal. So thank you yeah. for not giving me an enormous heart attack. Good. We should have done it, Pat. That, that's, that's, that's all I have to hear. Opportunity lost. Hearing that he was on airplane mode would have made it all the much better. Right, because then we could have peppered him. We could have peppered him with like six or seven. Hello, you hello, wait. Right. You, you Dylan, did. Dylan, are you there? And then we're not even explaining what it was. That was a big mistake by us. Missed opportunity. Dang it. Oh, well. Let the kid enjoy his vacation. He's certainly earned it. Steve. That's true. He has earned it. You've earned it as well. You have a good. You have a good summer. Yeah, it was good. No, nice. uh, no trips to Europe or anything. But we got some good time off. Spent some good time with the fam. Lovely, lovely. And the two of you are right back into it. Throwing right into the thick of it. <clears throat> Head to Indianapolis this week. Big Ten Media Days. Uh, always a fun couple of days. I mean, you know, if you want to get headfirst into all things Big Ten, I think we know what the predominant topic's going to be about. I mean, I think most of the, everyone's going to want to talk about Northwestern. Interesting that the Wildcats are available the same day as Rutgers. So you're going to have, I mean, it's just going to be nonstop, I'm guessing. And it's, of course, extremely relevant to Rutgers because that's the season opener as well. So I think you're going to hear a lot about hazing. You're going to hear about all of Rutgers playing the Wildcats. What are your guys' thoughts on this? That that story was breaking you know, what stuck out to you about that whole saga? I read it all back when I came back. Like I wasn't, I think it started breaking right around either the day I left or the day before I left. So um, it's insane, right? How it all kind of seemed to snowball yeah. um, just, and it seemed it, even this morning, there was a report that a, a former volleyball player at the school is filing a lawsuit. It's like, there's four or five sports. Uh, it right. seems like a, an institutional issue. I'm, Surprised that Pat Fitzgerald was the only guy that fell on the sword, and it seems like they just kept the entire rest of the the coaching staff, which probably should be just as informed about what's going on in the locker room as Pat. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you got to keep a staff around to coach. You can't really someone's hire time. Yeah, someone's yeah. got to do it, right? Yeah. Um, but it's weird, and I think that on the Rutgers end of things, this just really turns a game that they needed to win to have a successful season into a game they, I mean, they really can't lose this game now, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the thing that struck me, two things. Number one, you're absolutely right that this has gone from a must win game to a the famous must can't lose. You can't lose this game now. I mean, that, just not without knowing what's going to happen, without knowing how many players are going to transfer. You're still in a situation where that program is in 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 some set of crisis that if Rutgers can't beat Northwestern to start the season, that's, that's a bad sign. The other thing that struck me, Pat, and tell me if you agree. I, mean, I flashbacks to to the Mike Rice saga in a lot of ways. And, and not just, not just based on the national reaction, but uh, to me, it was just such a terrible job by the university in handling it out there because you have this saga, you think you're going to, you, you know, the, you know that hazing is a, 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 just a massive touchstone issue for, for college athletics. And you think you're going to release it with a two, two week suspension in the middle of summer and people aren't going to ask, well, what happened? Right. Like that was it's just amazing to me that 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 they thought this was just going to this was just going to disappear. Of course. Yeah, of course, it didn't disappear. It just blew up and became even worse. How fast it blew up too was equivocal, yeah. but e equal parts to Mike Rice. Right. Like that. It went from 
Pat Fitzgerald had no idea what was going to go, what was going on. So all of a sudden he was a big part of it. Yeah. Just, it, it really happened really quickly. And I thought that was one of my biggest reactions to it was how fast that it all unraveled and how, how quickly it took the truth to come out, which right. I guess is a good thing <laughs> to uh, think about what media day is going to be like for Northwestern. I, if, if it was possible, I don't know what it is from the, whatever the fine would be from the big 10 to not go to media day. <laughs> I would I would have taken it if I was my last turn. Because yeah, we're, we're, those poor kids. Think about the kids sitting there at that table, just answering every single question after every single question. At some point, you have to feel bad for the kids that are 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 now, you know, answering for their involvement and what they what they know. And I, I have a little of bit of a, a soft spot for the kids that are going to be. Well, you feel terrible. If, absolutely, you feel terribly for them. Yeah, and they don't have any answers. And and to me, the the bigger question than this is getting off uh, being path of the boot on Northwestern, but like what's going to happen to that athletic department as a whole? You know, obviously they've been a Big Ten member forever. They're invested in facility wise and playing big time athletics. But I've just seen a couple of statements out of Northwestern that makes you wonder if this is not the kind of thing that if not changes their commitment to athletics in the highest level, certainly puts it in a different perspective as to what they're going to do. And I'm, I'd be very curious to see what that, that, that place looks like in a couple of years. So Rutgers steps into the situation where that's their opener, but they're also there to answer questions. And this is interesting to me. I try to think about like what topics are going to be thrown at Greg Schiano and the three Rutgers players who are Aaron Lewis, uh, Dion Jennings and Johnny Langan, is that still correct? Who are going? Yep. yep. That's yep. correct. So, I mean, I'm just, what do you think? What are your sense? What are people going to be asking Rutgers? Is, is it, is it simply national questions about Northwestern? Are they going to field questions about Shiano's progress, about Gavin Wimsett? What do you think the topics are? I would say 50% will be about Northwestern slash NIL just because NIL, they're, yep. uh, and I mean, frankly, most people outside of us, the Rutgers beat don't really have intimate knowledge of Rutgers and, if you're going to gather around Greg Schiano's podium, you're going to ask him about big picture stuff, which he's very mm-hmm. good with. And then on the Rutgers end, my biggest thing that I think most people are curious about is one, who's going to start at quarterback, which I would be very surprised if Greg, you know, out and said who's going to be the starter. And two, how will Kirk Schrock change the offense? I think those are the two biggest questions. Right. Definitely big. I would just add, anytime anyone asks me about Rutgers, just in general, it's how far is Rutgers from competing and being a competitive Big yeah. Ten team? And it's so hard to answer that question, of course, but I think that's the overarching theme of Media Day. Like, Rutgers can't go backwards. What's the next step forward for Shiano in year four? That's been the question for 10 years, of right. course, <laughs> when you go to when you go to these national things. And you're right, Greg Shiano is excellent on the national stuff. I have to wonder if people are in tune to just how bad Rutgers was offensively next last year. And if that's going to be a major topic, the fact that Johnny Langan is the only uh, offensive player certainly, you know, makes that a little harder to, you know, I could ask Aaron Lewis about it. Uh, And I'm also curious if there is any interest on Aaron Lewis as like a national college football high level player. And, and to me, it's fascinating on two levels. One, you know, to be the preseason big 10 guy. And two, I I think there's going to be some people who are going to wonder, all right, what made you commit to staying at Rutgers in this culture, in this current, in this current era of movement? We've seen two basketball players leave, obviously. We've seen it nationally in college football. This is a guy who's committed to Rutgers. And I think that's going to be, he has a really big opportunity, I think, in front of the national media to speak to what's going right in Piscataway. Another really interesting thing about Aaron Lewis, too, is I don't this was before Brian or my time and Brian's time, of course, but what brought Aaron Lewis to Rutgers? Mm-hmm. Remember, he was committed to Michigan. And would have been obviously a high level player at Michigan. I'm I'm still really curious what, what I don't know if that story was ever told. Right. Well, that, he, might, that might be our that might be our day one media story. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm glad I could I'm glad I could help here with your coverage plan. Anything else you're looking to, to see, Brian, while you're out there? Oh, well, and Aaron Lewis, I just want to add, like, I think he could be one of the better edge rushers in the Big Ten. And I don't think that most people in the Big Ten are conscious of of that. And if he did stay at Michigan, I I mean he could have been part of two national that two teams that made the playoff, right? And he could have played a big part there. So mm-hmm. I think Pat makes a good point there. Johnny Langan, I think the offensive thing is an issue because most teams send their quarterback to these things. Uh, Rutgers obviously can if they haven't named a quarterback. And there's not really a lot of superstars on that side of the ball. And I think Johnny Langan has some personality, has some strong personality, I think is fair mm-hmm. to say. Uh, so I think he'll be he'll be fun to talk to. But uh, with Deion Jennings, I'd be interested to hear his thoughts on the linebacker room because 
you know, last year there was a, a crisis of just him and Tyreen Powell being the yeah. only two guys essentially. And now you got Moses Walker and you got uh, Muhammad Ture coming back and now they're a position of strength. So I think his insight on that would be interesting. And just the, the state, how they feel about, you know, to, to Pat's point, like what are the expectations for this season? Like what would be success to Rutgers? The mm -hmm. win total is four and a half, right? Is it making a bowl game? Is it competing for a bowl game? I think this is an interesting season and in kind of seeing what the fair expectations are. All right. So do you bring that up at the, the linebacker room? Pat, you did a great story this week on one question facing every position group, which I thought because and you, you really drilled down on a couple of things that I hadn't really thought about. To me, I'm curious what you think is the biggest position battle, like which camp is going to start here in a week. What is the one position group that you're most interested to see on the field? It's got to be wide receiver. There's no question about who's going to emerge at wide receiver is, is the biggest storyline. Rutgers lost its three leading receivers from last season and has a serious question mark. So many guys uh, potentially stepping up, but at the top of the list are the two transfers that are coming in for one year. Nassim Brantley out of Western Illinois and Jacque Jackson from California University of Pennsylvania, the Division II school. So I know Rutgers is really looking at those two guys to be veteran presence in the room, uh, along with Isaiah Washington is another name that's a veteran who had a nice spring. The wide receivers got to be the number one position battle. And if I if I'll throw you a second one, it would be who replaces Christian Izian at safety because he was such a high impact player for me last year. The way that he kind of uh, stepped up and filled the hybrid kind of role as a safety linebacker, like a Troy Polamalu type that uh, mm -hmm. played the run really well. I don't know that Rutgers has a run stuffing safety, but uh, they brought in Michael Flip Dixon from Minnesota as a transfer to to maybe fill that role. Um, you also have Shaquan Loyal coming back and uh desmond igbenosan the leader of the dark side our guy <laughs> the dark side <laughs> that's good to, to go ones i'm also in this, this i throw this one out there too because there'd be so much talk about uh, kirk shirak and what's he going to do to rebuild the offense i'm going to be very curious to see what pat flaherty does with the offensive line i know you've got three entrenched starters there at the same time you know this is a unit that's obviously not performed at it's the biggest, if not wide receiver, certainly one of the biggest problems in Big Ten competitions that can't block block elite defensive line. I'm just curious if having a guy like that, you're finally you've got you could pick one offensive line coach that the name that people in the state know. It's Pat Flaherty. What can he do with guys who have been there for a while and some of these young guys who we keep on? I mean, the recruiting class a couple of years ago, everyone was waiting for to see to see those guys step up and and into into roles where they're where they're playing more often. I'd be curious to see. What happens there? Fonseca, you got one for me that we haven't mentioned? I do, and I'm glad you guys didn't mention this. Uh, kicker. Okay. Uh, I think kicker. That's a, kicker. Kicker, yeah. We got oh, a kicking no. battle going on. Uh, Jude McAdamney's back, uh, but he did not have uh, a great year that makes him a lock. And Jay Patel had a really good spring, uh, so they'll be entering camp competing for the starting spot, uh, which is good, I think, in a way, to have two guys who are capable of competing and bad in a way that you'd obviously like uh, you know, a stone cold lock at starting in that position. But uh, that's the one I'm most excited to see, and that's a position that Rutgers has not had. Well, until I, you tell me, when's the last like lockdown kicker Rutgers has had? I can't really remember off the top of my head. Jeremy Ito, I mean, is that going to is that going too far back? I don't know. San San T. San San T. He was pretty good. Yeah, he was very good. Yeah. Kyle Federico was that guy. I, I remember the name. Was he good? Federico. Yeah, yeah. He was he was solid. Yeah. They, they, yeah. Have you been have you been sitting there each week uh, looking at the CFL uh, punting stats to see to see what's going on? I saw Chris Carlin tweeted yesterday that uh, Adam Corsack is leading the league in some category that I can't remember. Didn't Corsack punt to Janarian Grant? Yes, <laughs> at, at yeah. one point too. Right. And Janarian Grant country. returned it for a touchdown, yeah. breaking <laughs> breaking all of all of central Alberta on the way back or wherever Saskatchewan is. That's Alberta, right? Yeah. Every single tackle is pretty amazing. Um, that's how long it's been since we've recorded is that happened maybe a month ago. And we, yeah. We talked right. about it. That was yeah, that was true. Yeah, it was great. Also, it took 15 minutes to bring up Corsac uh, on a podcast, which is pretty good. I know. I already miss him. You, you get to know a guy after 15 years of covering him in college. <laughs> All right. Any other football thoughts? We can do some hoops and then we'll get some questions from uh, from the masses. Not really. I, I think uh, what's the over under on when Greg Schiano names a starting quarterback? What day is the what day is the game? The opener is on Sunday, August 3rd. Okay. So how about Sunday, August 3rd? Uh, not Sunday, August 3rd. Sunday, September 3rd. September Sorry. 3rd. September 3rd. Uh, he's, I don't know if does he have, I mean, that's a good, that's a great question. And 
he didn't obviously for obvious reasons didn't do it last year because his quarterback was secretly hurt um this year I mean, is there some value in, in giving a, a boost, boost of confidence? I mean, I, I, I would be stunned if it's not Gavin Winslet. It would be a big surprise. Is is it going to be another situation where he's going to say, well, we're going to play two quarterbacks and just not name a starter? Uh, it could be that again. I don't know. That's a question for him on media day, I guess. Be a great question on media day. Absolutely. Put that on your list. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he gets any, does he get any value? But I mean, it's not like it's a, it's a secret here. It's going to be one of those two guys, unless something really crazy happens. Um, and one of them gets hurt. Uh, yeah, I think, and I would like, I would like to know too, what his, what has to be his criteria, I guess. Like, what, what does he have to see to make that decision? And, you know, obviously he's expecting both those players to be, take a big jump, especially Gavin Wimsett. He's putting a lot of eggs in that basket, as we've discussed in this podcast many times already, by not bringing in someone experienced in the portal. Yeah, that's a great question. Pat, what's your guess? My guess is it's going to be fairly quick because really? my sense is that they wanted to get Shiraka paired with Gavin and get them rolling as soon as possible. I wrote in that questions facing each position that the quarterback competition might only be in name only. And that even in spring ball, it seemed like Gavin was the guy mm-hmm. and Evan was kind of the backup. Evan Simon, of course. So we'll see. I, I my, my guess is sooner rather than later. And I think he will name a starter after learning from his mistake of last year, which ended up being a complete disaster. That's true. Good point. All right, let's jump the hoops and then we'll answer some more football stuff and, and uh, your uh, uh, questions. Kind of an interesting trip down to North Augusta, Georgia here or South Augusta, Georgia, wherever the peach jam is. A couple of major storylines, both reported excellently by Adam Zagoria of our staff. First one. Obviously, Dylan Harper played well uh, and is not making a decision until now, maybe during the season, which, of course, means you could do look at the calendar. It could be months from now. He still wants to take three visits, the visits including uh, Kansas, Auburn and Rutgers. He's been to Rutgers a couple of times, but still has not visited officially for that's kind of wild. And also Steve Peichel asked directly by Zagoria, is this an NCAA team? He said 100 percent. Like he is not backing down, losing Paul Mulcahy and Cam Spencer is not enough for him to back off the idea that this is a team that's going to make the tournament. Fonseca, what do you think about those two developments? I would have been shocked if Steve Michael said that Rutgers is not an NCAA tournament yeah, team. Tough. That's a tough way to answer that. Yeah. He's a he's a very positive guy in general, and I think it would be pretty you know stunning if he had said otherwise. I think he believes it. I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm just saying mm-hmm. uh, it sounds about. Sounds about right. They sent four coaches down to Peach Jam that were uh, front row, center court, every game for Dylan Harper. They were in Hungary for the FIBA U18 uh, World Championships that Harper played in. If Dylan Harper was playing a pickup game in uh, Park and Carney, they would all be there courtside. I think they're pretty determined to um, show Dylan Harper that they really, 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 really want him. And you, think, you think by now the kid would have a pretty good feeling about that, right? <laughs> I, th- I think he's gotten the hint, but you know Got how he's a teenage boy. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Uh, so I think they're trying really hard to show we want you to come to Rutgers. So, uh, and I think that goes a long way. Uh, them them being the only uh, Rutgers sent two coaches. It was Steve Peichel and Brandon Knight to Hungary. Uh, Kansas had a coach there, an assistant coach. I don't know if he was there specifically for Dylan Harper. They're also recruiting Trey Johnson, who was on the team. The the point being that Rutgers is doing literally everything they can uh, to get Dylan Harper, and that's why they're in it for him, and they're going to be in it with him for the end. And they, I think, they have a very good chance of being the one he picks. And you know, is this an NCAA tournament team? We can kind of debate the merits of that when the roster is done, uh, which should be uh, happen by the time they go to Senegal and Portugal uh, in a couple of weeks. Some movement should happen soon. Um, there's been some reporting that Oscar Palmquist is back in the transfer portal. Uh, it sounds like him coming back to Rutgers is a very legitimate possibility, which is a fascinating scenario. And another, just another turn in a very wacky off season. Like it feels like we're playing Mad Libs at this point. I think it's a, if it does come to fruition, a great return, right? I think if he was still on the roster and hadn't transferred, people would say it's good to have him on the roster. I think the, the fact that he would be leaving and coming back makes this a bit of a strange situation, but I think overall it would be a good move for Rutgers. So, and they have a couple of guys, Jeremiah Williams, Iowa state transfer is visiting this week. Uh, and Austin Williams, an FIU transfer from Jersey, went to see all prep. He visited a couple of times there on him. So it, Which any one of, of those guys is most likely to, to commit both one. So I would say, so Rutgers has three open scholarships left. So in theory, mm-hmm. all three could commit. 
Um, Oscar including Palm Palmquist, you mean, right, yeah. Including Palmquist. I think Palmquist, has, there's a very good shot of him coming to Rutgers, um, sure. coming back to Rutgers. I Known quantity. Yep. Known quantity. Uh, Austin Williams, I think Rutgers has a very good shot of landing him as well. Uh, and Jeremiah Williams is a bit of a strange situation in that he'd be a two-time transfer as an undergrad, so he'd need a waiver to play next year, which is pretty unlikely. Mm-hmm. And he's coming off an Achilles injury that didn't let him play at all last year. Right. Um, so even if he did commit, I would be pretty shocked if he played at all next season. He'd be more of a 2024-25 deal, um, which would make sense because Michael usually does not use all 13 scholarships for right. players. Right. He'd be the 13th scholarship, but he wouldn't play, right? So that doesn't really affect the uh, rotation and the begging for playing time that is the chemistry issue that he'd be worried about. So that's where the Rutgers hoops stands right now, and the non-conference schedule will be announced at some point. Sounds like it's finalized, but they're still working through contracts. So. So it's fascinating to me. Getting back to Dylan Harper really quick before I move on. Um, you know, it seems like forever we've been talking. It's down Rutgers and Duke, and I, I, I don't. Something about seeing Kansas still on that list and knowing he's visiting there, and just knowing that that's one one of the programs that can spend money on players. Like you have no question that if Kansas really, if money was the number one thing, and LA was the number one thing, and Kansas really felt like it needed Dylan Harper. For next season, Pat, it would it would spend money on Dylan Harper, right? That to me, uh, that's the name that that's funny. That's wouldn't the Duke, name that scares Duke, me more. Duke be in that same category, Duke basketball, I, right? Yeah, but I think Duke's but probably got. I mean, I don't know, hundred percent. You're hundred percent right. Uh, it's just so fascinating. What we didn't talk about with football was the recruiting strides that Shanna's made in this last month or so. Uh, that maybe we could hit on that later. We will. But think about think about how much credit Chiano has gotten for building a potentially top 25 class. Think about what Rutgers would be with the number one and two players. And how many times in the history of college basketball has a school gotten talk about every blue blood, the number one and two players. That, that's crazy. If that's Rutgers gets, if Rutgers gets the number one recruiting class in the country. It will be the most surprising story in my 25 years of covering college of sports up here. Not even close. Yeah, I, I, right. If you I, told me that in 1989, 1998, when I came back to the Star Ledger, and like, you know, someday Rutgers basketball is going to have the best recruiting class in the country, I'd be like, what? Yeah, but not even like what? you can get the best recruiting class by by having, you know, a, a top 10 guy and some other guys. Right. How about one and two? They have the number two class right now without having the number oh. one player. It's crazy. Oh, yes. I know. It's remarkable. Remarkable. It's, I just can't. It's fascinating. Yeah. It is fascinating. And that to me, and it's funny, Brian, tell me if you agree. Like that to me, that story, that storyline, if if that happens in the fall or, or spring, it really does, it really does overshadow what happens on the court this year in a lot of ways. Right? Am I wrong about that? I get it. The basketball games will be going in front of us. There'll be expectations on the court. What's going to happen if this team is NIT and NCAAs? I get it. But still, if they have signed the number one recruiting class in the country, that team can go to the NIT and everyone, the fan base is not going to go crazy. Yeah, I think even before it's even happening, people are kind of already, I wouldn't say writing the season off, but people are already looking forward to 24-25 and what could be. So in a way, it does soften the blow of if this is a team that doesn't make it to the NCAA tournament, I think people will brush that off really quickly and uh, look forward to the future. I do think it's a bit tough for Gavin Griffiths, who a year ago was the number one recruit in program history, like the highest ranked kid they've ever signed. And now his freshman year is kind of a, you know, an afterthought because people are already looking forward to next year. It's a great sign for Rutgers because it's a sign of how quickly they're progressing. Uh, but I, I got to kind of feel for the kid because it does feel like in, in any year of the year, everyone would be so excited to see him take the court and see what he can do. And now people still are be. Of, yeah, right. I mean, they will be. But I still think that if, if Dylan Harper and Ace Bailey sign in November, uh, his however, Gavin Griffiths does against Long Island University won't really be the bigger story. That's That's true. You just that's just a little scheduled dig. I like that. Little little quiet schedule dig. I wouldn't say that. I mean, that's the fact. That's who they're playing. Yeah, it's all right. Well, let's be flip before we move on. Is this so every year it seemed like we were like waiting for oh, there's 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 one more game. There's a big game coming. They're gonna play power five team and it's gonna be at Brooklyn or the Garden or and then like we're we're still waiting for that. Like we're still waiting for that, right? Is there another game other than the the schedule? Because the schedule we're seeing right now is hmm. They're, yeah. they're going to play Mississippi State at the Prudential Center. They're committed. That happened. No, I must the contract that. is not signed. Okay, well, you missed gotcha. it because it was reported on Fourth of July. Ah, um, gotcha. Okay. Right. Mississippi State. They were a 
they're the team that beat them for the <laughs> to date, weren't they? Isn't that the Mississippi I, State? I believe so. Mississippi okay. State is just Rutgers in the SEC, elite gotcha. defense, horrendous offense. Right. Um, it, the game is going to be, you know, 31 29 with four minutes left to play. At the potential center. <laughs> okay. Yes, there was uh, talks of playing at UBS in Long Island, uh, playing at MSG uh, with you know some big name teams, and those things all kind of just fell through. So um, gotcha. they got that. They got the Princeton game, which we haven't talked about, which is a pretty big. Oh, uh, that's right. Yes, get. It's always good to get Princeton after their NBA prospect uh, <laughs> leaves. Just that's a good, time, good, well time. Once in a generation, I'm NBA sure prospect. they're exactly the great, the great one of the greatest. Cinderella runs in recent history. Uh, play that team the year after. Good, smart, smart scheduling, and to do it uh, in Trenton, really. Yeah, that, why wouldn't they? They just couldn't make it commit to home and home. Is that what it was? They agreed to a neutral site game, one off okay. this year. There's yeah. a potential of the series continuing after this year, but nothing concrete as far as I know. And I think that, while I would have, I think most people would have preferred home and home. I think that game could have a pretty decent sized audience, and if it's good. I think the juice of it could uh, go a long way in yeah. rekindling the rivalry. Right. I think it just, when you play in, it, obviously it's Trenton's not Jadwin and Jadwin is kind of a interesting, uh, unusual venue that would help you, I think, down the line when you're playing in some of the tougher Big Ten places. But okay, still better than not playing Princeton. Step in the right direction with scheduling. All right, one other basketball thing before we, we have some questions with it too, but I want to mention Phil Sellers did a column on him uh, last week. Uh, from what I understand, he is still... Doing okay health wise. If you had, if you didn't read it, uh, he had some health setbacks. Uh, was touch and go there for a while. His family was worried that the the greatest player in Rutgers history uh, might not make it. He did he did pull through, and he's been bouncing back between a hospital and a rehab facility. Um, the family asked people to reach out in the Rutgers community to uh, help support his extended care, which he's going to need for a long time. Over $100,000. Good job by Rutgers fans. I think they set a goal at 150 So it's getting there for, for the, the GoFundMe page, which you can find if you just uh, Google Phil Settlers and GoFundMe. Um, but from what I understand, he is doing uh, okay. Not great. Not through the woods yet, but still okay, which is good because uh, obviously it wasn't good. Uh, didn't, uh, was, there's a lot of concern early on about that. All right. Dive into some uh, questions. You guys want to take some insider questions? I'll pass. Hey, too bad. You always, you always ask us if we want to do it. <laughs> Let's do it. You pass. We okay. want true and false Good. back. But true and false. Yeah, well, I think when the season comes, we'll get true and false back, right? When we have something to talk, when we have something in front of us, I can say true or false. Yeah. You know, the, the the team MVP is Adam Korsak, even though he's the yeah. true statement on your end. True statement. Like, okay. We'll do, well, I promise. I'll, I'll get that back. Um, all right, so we had a couple questions on hazing, which is understandable with the devastating hazing scandal in Northwestern. What is in place at Rutgers? So something like this will never occur at Rutgers. I said to the, I said to both Pat and, and Brian before the, we started that that's a great question for Greg Shano in Indianapolis this week. I think he's he's going to talk about it, and I believe he's going to talk about um, the culture and the family part of what Rutgers has built. Uh, I think he is really in tune to this stuff. And I, I, he's not blowing smoke about it. I, I I don't, I mean, I think that's the most important thing you can have when you're talking about this is having someone who is a head coach, who is aware of this, who monitors it, who cares about it. I think that's the most important thing. As far as what's going on in the locker room, that's a good question, guys. Have you heard anything specifically about what, you know, what sort of things are in place at Rutgers? I know they have the leadership council. I'm sure every school has a leadership council, but I know there's, there's a uh, significant duties attached to being a captain at Rutgers and monitoring the locker room, and keeping morale high has to be at least at the very minimum, something that Rutgers does. Right. Uh, but like you said, a great question for Shiano that we will certainly ask. I'm sure there's a reporting system of some sort. Um, the school itself has a reporting system. I, th I think there, there's something there, but yes, we will get specifics if we can. Right. All right, a lot of questions, of course, about the quarterback situation. A couple in particular. So some some of our uh, texters are concerned about the fact that if Wimsett has not established himself as the quarterback, whether or not he is just a sign that he's not playing well. Um, with the decision not to pursue a quarterback of any caliber in the portal, is it more likely that Gavin had a conversation with the staff about play me or I'm leaving? This room, again, feels like it could have benefited from a ball manager like Vedral. Uh, but was Wimsett concerned another fifth-year quarterback was going to play over him? Interesting uh, way of putting it. I don't know. I, I don't think, you know, I, I don't know how much of a concern it was 
for for Gavin Wimpet to leave because he doesn't have he doesn't have on tape that he's. I mean, he hasn't proven he's a power five quarterback yet. So is, unless someone's taking him just on sheer talent alone, Rutgers is committed to him. He likes to likes Greg Schiano. I think I, you know he's put a lot of time in this system. He, I, I don't think that there there was any sort of play me or, or forget it. I would tend to agree. It's, it's credible. We're clamoring for Noah Vedral, a Noah Vedral clone to come. I, <laughs> Can it, you imagine? That's great, isn't it? I, there's no winning here. When he when Noah Vedral's here, it's you know, Noah Vedral this, Noah Vedral that, and now he's gone, and everyone's clamoring for him to come back. It's it's uh, nobody knows what they want. Um, I would I agree with you. You make an interesting point. He was Gavin Wimsett was the second least accurate quarterback in Power Five football last year. Um, so I don't know what his market value would be. I think there is high hopes that combined with his health being back at 100% after he was nicked up last year and him being able not to run with that health, uh, with mm-hmm. working with Kirk Scirocco, who is apparently an elite teacher and will help Gavin Wimsett understand the offense, simplify concepts. And with his talent alone, with all that combined, I think there's hope that he can take the next step. And, you know, I don't know think he, I don't think he could take a step back. Um, so I think that's the, and we've talked about this quarterback thing a hundred times, like, I don't know if there was this magical quarterback in the portal that Rutgers could have gotten, but said, you know what? No, thanks. We're good with what we got. Right. I think that that's a straw man that doesn't exist. This is kind of really the best Avenue I think Rutgers had. And I'm cautiously optimistic about Rutgers quarterback play this season. Again, it can't get much worse. I think the partnership between Shiraka and Wimsett, there's some potential there. All right. This is a good one. Um, And and, I, Blanket statement from from one of our uh, one of our insiders, Evan Simon is clearly the best quarterback on the roster. What will he have to do to beat Gavin out and start from day one? I like that. Just a bold opinion on it. Um, I'm going to say this, I, and Pat, tell me if I'm wrong. I think it's as simple as which quarterback can make the easy throws. Let's just assume that this this offense is going to be a run based. It's going to be a, try to control the clock, try to move the chains. This is not going to be you know, or, or flashing it around. I mean, it's just going to be, we're going to be very conservative offense. If it is so that Evan Simon is the guy who can complete by a, a wide margin, the shorter passes, the, the throws to running backs that, 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 and if and it's, and it's, and if uh, Wimsack can't do it, I think that's how it gets there. That's a great assessment. I, I think you're totally right with most of what you said, but also decision-making was one of Evan Simon's biggest, yeah. flaws of last season he was the one who threw away the, the nebraska game let's not and, forget that right? in yeah. iowa <laughs> yeah in Iowa. yeah yep so yeah. so can he can he be the decision making has to be a quarterback's great strength it wasn't for either one last season but shiraka the great quarterback whisperer should <laughs> be the guy to get uh, i just feel like if when gavin understands the offense Things to get things get simpler with the, the successful run game. Third and short, uh, he has more running capabilities. I think he is a significantly better quarterback than Evan Simon. Just to disagree with our insider there, I think his potential is exponential. Potential. No one questions the potential. No, Whether no one questions the potential. Of course, better but, quarterback in September third. I guess is right. Yeah. Right. But you you can we've seen the arm strength for sure be a game changer for Gavin. It's can he get that accuracy issue resolved right. and and understand the grasp of the offense right he can throw a 60 yard pass can he throw a 10 yard pass all right another question how is running back sam brown doing is he healthy brian what do we know about sam brown we didn't see much of him in the spring what's what's the deal there i am fairly certain he will be ready for the start of training camp i can't remember if greg Chanel has said that publicly but i i believe he did right pat he did he he did at a golf outing yeah Yes, so I would expect him to be full go to start sp- training camp. I would expect them to probably not make him go do too much early on, right? But I think he'll be uh, good to go to start the season. All right, uh, recruiting questions. Obviously, recruiting has been just – you alluded to it earlier, Pat, but it's just been remarkable that this what's happening um, given the changes in the NIL. How is Greg Shannon putting together such a strong recruiting class in comparison to on the field re- re- results? It's a great question. <laughs> I'm not sure we have the answer, but it's a great question. I mean, what what's your sense in talking to people? First of all, Shannon has always been a great great recruiter. I, I feel like it's right. one of his one of his good strengths. So we'll start there. I think he finally has the pitch down where he is the salesman of the program, and he firmly believes in the two guys running his units, Sharaka and. Harris Simiak on defense. So I think 
that those guys seem like as possible hires he could have made and he's selling their potential and he's just really good at selling the, Hey, you can be the guy that changes things at Rutgers. And right. obviously he's been doing that for, for a lot of years. I, I know we haven't talked about what the recruitment of Kaj Sanders means, the kid from Bergen Catholic. Yep. Four-star recruit. Safety, right? Safety athlete. I think he's going to play a lot of offense this year from, from what I've been uh, told at the high school level. But um, it just, it was crazy to me. I, I, I go way back with Augie Hoffman and Nunzio Campanelli from their high school days and my high school days. But in their time at Rutgers, they never landed a four-star recruit from one of the Catholic schools up north, they both leave and Rutgers gets one of the biggest recruits out of North Jersey. And yeah. Oh, it, pick them over Syracuse too. Am I, am I mistaken about that? Or? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, hmm. so yeah, of course, Nunzio Campanelli is at Syracuse now is what Politi is alluding to there. So I think that was a, a, a huge win. And, but to right. answer the question, how does it, how, how is it such a strong recruiting class in comparison to on-field results? <sighs> Maybe people know. see <laughs> they see a need that can they see playing time. I mean, he's got he can sell that. Yeah, uh, for sure. He's always been able to sell a developmental program. Um, that's his big thing. He points to the guys in the pros all the time. Uh, I think he's got some new recruiters. And I've heard nothing but great things about what Scott Fallone, mm. former Rutgers player, is doing. I don't know. It's great. You know, he's got the. I mean, the 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 recent for me, we, he was have it was a good class until a few weeks ago when he started getting the four stars. Uh, got New York's top re- top recruit again. That <laughs> seems right. like it happens every year now. Yeah. KJ Duff, uh, the receiver, which of course they uh, they they need pretty uh, and and they're getting track stars too. He's recruiting speed, which is his big thing. Uh, see some guys who also run track for them. So I mean, hey, I I think if you, you could ask Greg Shannon that question, he will answer it in a five minute answer, and you will still not know. Exactly. Right. Like he, we, someone's going to ask him that. Someone's going to ask him that in Indianapolis. He's going to talk for five minutes and you're like, oh, okay. I still don't know why he's doing it. It'll, and it'll also come back to that a 22 year old man is different from an 18 year old yes. kid. <laughs> and that Rutgers is now in the position where those, they have 21 and 22 year old right. players on this team. Yes. Uh huh. But yeah. they haven't had that for the last three years. <laughs> the Greg Shannon bingo card. You could put the, but that's the center square on that one. That is always filled. Uh, all right. So I hope we did. We tried to answer. But we didn't really, really, really quick. Shout out to Marquis Watson as well. He's a one of the probably the best recruiter on the staff. I think he deserves a lot of credit for uh, a lot of this. Is kids. true. Absolutely. I think no he, he was a huge uh, win in the off season. Ole Miss came calling for him. They re-signed him to a new contract. Gave him a bump. Uh, so that's probably the biggest along with all the hires they made on the offensive side of the ball to keep him and to keep Joe Harris Simiak, uh, were very big wins for Rutgers. I would say. Absolutely. Good oh, point. Another plug for Marquise Watts and a, a name that we haven't brought up as a, as, as a newcomer that could be a starter is Isaiah Eaton. He's going to be a defensive tackle. He came from Ole Miss and apparently Watson was, was a recruit. He recruited him to Ole Miss and that Watson also helped bring him to Rutgers. So potential starter from the SEC who, who uh, he didn't start at Ole Miss, but he got some time at Ole Miss, which is an impressive get for Rutgers. So Isaiah Eaton is a name to remember. All right. Another recruiting question. Asa Newell. That's a new name, newish name. What are the odds? Can Pike land a five Fab Five class with Dylan and Asa? Wondering what you guys are hearing. Asa and Ace. Asa and Ace. I love it. Steve from Olbers wants to know. I mean, what? Uh, how do they get? They already have that class. Would be if they got. Bring this through. If they got Dylan Harper, Ace Bailey, already have four stars. Lathan Somerville, Brian Dorch. They have room for another guy. Uh, Rutgers did offer Asa Newell as a top 10 kid. He played on the FIBA U18 team with right. um, yeah. Dylan Harper. I think Rutgers was aware of him before that, but um, they offered recently. I believe there is some connection uh, with uh, newly hired assistant coach Marlon Williamson. I believe our friends of the night report had reported that. Um, so th- is Rutgers in it? They're a bit late in the process. Normally this is around the time kids are deciding and Rutgers is now throwing its hat in the ring, but you know, you can't win unless you play. Right. So they're throwing their hat in the ring. Uh, they're feeling confident given, you know, they already have Ace Bailey, who's the number two kid. They're in it with Dylan Harper who's number one. So uh, is there a chance? I, I there's, there's, there's a non-zero chance to get him. I would just be surprised if Asa Newell came, uh, especially considering all the blue bloods that are already after him and have been after him for a while. So it's nice to dream, yeah. but I would, I would caution people to start hitting the brakes a little bit that um, the class is already good enough. If they get two the top two kids, I think yeah. asking for another top 10 kid is a bit greedy. Right. The top two kids with two other four stars. Yeah, it does seem. Yeah. I was surprised to see that one, but Hey, 
if he's maybe he just wants to maybe they wants to play with uh, play with Dylan Harper. Who knows? <clears throat> All right. Here's one more question about the schedule. How do finances work for neutral court basketball games? Does Prudential Center play Rutgers and Mich- Mich- Mississippi State or do schools rent it and keep the money? I have no idea. Do you know the answer, Brian? I don't, and I reckon it's uh, typically on a case by case basis. I know mm-hmm. Rutgers is still working out on the contract on a few games, this one included, but that sounds about right. You know, teams rent out the arena, and then the uh, both teams split the gate. It's a neutral site in theory, right? It's uh, shout out to Rutgers for the scheduling genius of putting a neutral site game against a team from Mississippi forty minutes from their home arena. <laughs> like, I, I'm not, and I'm not being. I might sound like I'm being ingenuous. I'm being serious. That is a very smart, very strong move. Right. To get, uh, you know, th- that'll be about as neutral site as, as playing neutral. the game at the rack. Yes, like the neutral. We're going to call it neutral, like the neutral site at the garden. We don't play at the garden. Right. A home game at the garden. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. And for people, people that right. I don't know how serious people were worried about the Big Ten designating this as a home game. This isn't a Big Ten game and the NCAA yeah. isn't going to designate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So this is going to be a neutral site game right. against a, a quad one opponent, 40 minutes from your place. Pretty good. So, uh, but yeah. yeah. The schedule, you feel good about the schedule. You feel better about the schedule than you did last year? Well, we have to get the schedule confirmed first. But from what we understand, this is the most high major teams Rutgers has scheduled. It's four. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Granted, two of them are two of them are contracts in the sense that there's one is the Gava games and one is Seton Hall. Still, right. four. It's pretty good. Uh, to get Princeton back on the schedule, huge, I think. Uh, mm-hmm. Not only for the, the net, but for the... Um, just the symbolic, the rivalry aspect of it. And the teams they're facing, yes, they're playing three bottom sub-300 teams on Ken Palm, including literally the worst team in college basketball last season. But they're playing a couple of teams in the mid-200s, which is all we've been asking for. You know, that's that's been our suggestion for years now, is that instead of scheduling the bottom 50 teams, maybe schedule a bottom 150 team. Howard, which was 218 last year, no guarantee they're going to be 218 again because they got decimated by the portal, as a lot of these teams did. Uh, but that you all you could do is go off of past projections. Getting Howard a 218 team instead of Coppin State, which was originally on the schedule, and they were 331. Howard's 218. That's a hundred spot jump. That's pretty good. Is it a great schedule? I would not say that. They're <clears throat> probably going to be bottomed to you know in the sub 200 category. But to not be one of the 50 worst schedules or weakest non conference schedules right. in the country, huge jump. My problem is you just still don't have that game. You go, wow, hey, they're playing Gonzaga. At- you know, they still don't have that high le- that high level game you could excited about, right? Right, and they're not in a feast week tournament. But my understanding is they're working on both for next season: one, a feast week tournament, and getting at least one marquee game. So, um, right. and I think you, it's probably easier in multiple ways next year in that you'll have a better roster with more stars on it. That'll make it a higher, a bigger appeal for other teams to want to play. And I think uh, Rutgers will be more confident in playing those games with the talent they'd have next year. Excellent. All right. Anything else? We've got the Women's World Cup. If you're watching it, uh, Casey Murphy, Rutgers goaltender, is back up. I don't know if she's going to play and then coming up, game come up against uh, the Netherlands or not. But still, that's still pretty cool to see her on the roster. Anything else, fellas? What does he got? Anything? I would I would assume Casey Murphy could play against Portugal because it'd be the third game and they'd probably already qualify. And if Casey is one of our loyal listeners, please do me a favor. Let in a goal or two. Let the let, let oh, the ladies. Come on. Come on, we need some help. We lost to the Netherlands the other day. They're probably going to beat Vietnam. They're going to need a win. Just let, it, let let one slip by. Just let one, you know. You. Just trying to do my job. Oh, he's caring about it. Full circle. Yeah, yeah there you go. full circle. Good job by us. Maybe we should just end there. Uh, really quick, uh, I yeah. do I do want to say a couple of things. One, in Portugal, I read three sports dailies every day. They have they have little newspapers that all they cover is sports, which is awesome. And uh, on a personal note, it rekindled my love for this job and why I want to do it in the first place. Yada, yada. That's real savvy stuff. But really? Yes. Wow. Um, I remember you went to Portugal and you found this is like a like a uh, discovery. This is like a like a like a chick uh, movie here. Am I allowed to say that? What like what's like chick flick? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, This is like you went off to Portugal and you uh, you eat, pray, sports kind of thing going on. Yes, yes, I am. Um, like, <laughs> gonna make a Barbie movie joke. It's not gonna work. I haven't watched Barbie or Oppenheimer. Have you watched either, Pat? I saw Oppenheimer. Amazing. Good. Bad. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And I saw Spider Man yesterday. Really current. Here's my thing. When I hear, my, I can end on a rant. When I was a kid, like I always say, when I was younger, there was one Spider Man. All right. There's just too many. There's too many Spider Mans now. Have you noticed? There's like there's like five million Spider Mans. 
Well, that's why what makes Oppenheimer so great. It's finally, it's not a superhero movie that's number one, or like right. we finally have a movie everyone wants to talk about that's not superhero related. Oppenheimer, right. because that's an upgrade. I that's you know happy <laughs> happy tale of of building a weapon of mass destruction. Sure, okay. Let's it's talk about the ethics about that. of it. It's about the ethics of it. I see. Understand. Gotcha. All right. So this is a perfect transition from the military industrial complex to the Rutgers podcast industrial complex. This is an appeal to our loyal listeners. The Rutgers podcast ecosystem has been out of control in the past six months. There are people, but in the two weeks that I've been gone, there have been enough Rutgers podcasts come out that I could listen to a thousand man hours of people talking about really in July. Uh, We got Aaron Brightman doing a daily podcast. We have the night report doing. He's doing a daily podcast in July. It it is uh, commendable. Uh, it's not something I don't think we could do, but this is where we come in. We ask our loyal listeners, please help us out. Throw us a five-star review. Tweet at us. Comment a little bit. Help us juice the numbers because we used to be the only show in town, but now it seems like everyone who has a microphone has a Rutgers podcast. So, I just um, can't imagine. Daily podcast in July. We can barely fill 45 minutes here once a month. Well, there you go. Well, I listened, yeah. I had an eight-hour flight back home, and I listened to about six hours worth of Rutgers podcast. Did you really? Didn't have not that it didn't didn't have a television. There wasn't like a movies available. You couldn't like watch a, you know, last summer's blockbusters on that flight. You had to watch. You listen to Rutgers podcast for. Well, I willingly listen to. What the were they podcast. talking about? What were they talking about that we didn't talk about for six hours? Well, pretty much all we talked about, and uh, it, truthfully, it all kind of blended all together. At some point, it was just yeah. noise so that the flight right. could go by. And in between, I did watch Ocean's Eleven for the first time. Pretty good movie, I gotta say. Um, current another current movie for you good yeah i mean that i had th- those were the choices at my disposal i also okay. watched invictus on the way uh to portugal oh there you go nice Samuel L. jackson very good uh but anyway just please guys if you're listening to this uh go on apple Podcasts, <laughs> spotify wherever you listen to your right. podcast drop us a five-star review uh we have no giveaway or anything we could provide for you on like our competition mm-hmm. uh but just know that it is greatly appreciated by steve pat and me and uh we will be doing weekly podcasts starting with the season. We'll have one next week. In fact, just put that we on will. the calendar, guys. Absolutely. Um, All right. So that's uh, that's my plea. Pat, do you have anything? Is, is there anything about wrestling or anything you can give to the people? No, no. It's been uh, just a quiet time and over the summer. So I don't I don't have a big wrestling update other other than what we've talked about uh, the last couple of times. So, but uh, I love your plea, and I agree that we're back. Season's coming up fast, and we're ready to roll. Yep. Thanks to everyone for listening to all of our subscribers to Devco, of course, and Chris Paladino doing a wonderful job as our sponsors. And we'll be back. Looking forward to it, fellas. Football, basketball, the whole kit and caboodle starting now. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.